Hello and welcome. My name is Robert Barsamian, and I lead our usher team here at Without Walls Church. We hope this message blesses you today, so please like and subscribe for future messages. Turning your Bibles to Numbers, the 12th chapter. We'll get right into this. Last week, last week I, uh, I asked you a question at the beginning of the message, and I followed it up at the end with the same question. The question was, is what governs you? In other words, who's, who's the governor of your life? The governor is an overseer, one who watches over, you know, establishes, you know, helps to establish law and protocol and so on, and people are to abide. You know, the governor of our state, if he sends down a mandate or whatever, the, we're required to be obedient to that. We may not always like it, but there are some requirements as long as they line up with the Word of God. The fact is this, is when we ask a question like that, as I said last week, what governs you? The first thing that your average Christian will say, and I say Christian because I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in a broad term, but a person who is a Christian in our eyes is somebody who is born again, receives Christ into their heart, he, repent of their ways, and they take up the life of Christ. In other words, they invite him in and they take on the resurrection life of Christ. The fact is, is praying a prayer and accepting Jesus as Savior is one thing, but him being your Lord is another thing. And sometimes we forget that or we just don't know that as a believer because we say, oh, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Well, wait a second. He may be your Savior, but is he your Lord? Does he govern your life by his spirit? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? In other words, the things that I command, the words that I teach. And, and then again, let me remind you after that verse there, in Matthew 7, he went on to say, many are going to come to me saying, Lord, Lord, did we not, you know, cast out devils and didn't we, you know, do many wonderful works and didn't we prophesy in your name? And he say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That means somebody, and understand it's a practice. It's not, I made a mistake. You know, I, I made a bad decision here. And it, it, it's a practice. It's something that, that, become somewhat consistent or continue in your life. It may not be every single day, but it can show its head consistently throughout your life. It's a practice. It's lawlessness. One who does not follow law. And we have the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God. So who is your governor? Who governs you? What is the authority in your life? Because whatever is your authority... Whatever you set your mind on, wherever your affections are, that's your Lord. <laughs> just let it permeate just for a second. Just let it seep in. I want you to think about something here. This is, this is important. I felt, like, I felt like this, I don't know, I felt today, I, I just needed to, to lay it here and just get it direct like I'm not any other time, but I'm going to go ahead and do it more today, all right? Because this is important. Do you understand that we love you? And my, my position as pastor, Dina's and my positions as pastor, is not to come up here and just preach a nice little pretty sermon and, and, and you know, make everybody happy. Uh, it's really to come up here and to prod you and to move you and to give you something that is truth that makes you uncomfortable. I hope you're clenching your behind right now because it's, it's got to be a little tighter because they say, oh no, here he goes again. He's getting, he's getting in my house. He's getting in my stuff. And the fact is I'm not trying to do anything because whatever I'm giving to you, I'll guarantee you I've gone through it all week long and before that. And God deals with me the very same way. So that's why this becomes life to me. And, and I hope that what is life to me then becomes life to, to you is you're open and receive it. So I just pray. Just say, Holy Spirit, I receive. Just say it. Come on. I receive anything you have for me today. Help me to have my mind open. Anything that would hinder for you from speaking to me and me receiving it, I bind it in Jesus' name. Yeah, you got a little quieter as we got going in there, but I'm, I'm trusting that that's what you're after. See, you carry God if you are a believer. And something you have to understand is that anywhere God has lived, uh, he, he has designed. You can, you can read from the beginning of this book to the end, from the table of contents to the maps, and you will not find anywhere where God did not have input on the place where he lived. 
In other words, everywhere God dwelt, he was the architect of that dwelling place. That means you. You, you, you see in the Old Testament where God dwelt in buildings, and then now we see in the New Testament where he dwells in men. And you are a house of God. Your body is a house, a temple of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. The church is a house of God, and we individually as well as corporately are to bring heaven to earth. In other words, we are to be a faith channel of heaven's influence into the earth. But the thing that we're finding today is that, is that the church, Dina even mentioned earlier, is not functioning in power. And what I mean by that, it's not functioning in power to the point and the level that this word says that we are to be functioning in. And I mean, I'm not saying there aren't people individually or pockets here and there, but I'm talking the church, the body of Christ at large. We're not advancing the kingdom like the initiation of the New Testament church showed us that we could be doing because of the power that we possess. Most times what I find is that people don't understand what it is they got. They pray to prayer, they receive Jesus as Savior, and that's the end. So they, they're not sure, then how do they take it a step further? That's why you've got to know the truth, and it's the truth you know that makes you free, Jesus said. So if you don't know the truth, you could have prayed a prayer and gotten saved and say, hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. But if you don't know the truth, I'm not sure you can walk out Christianity in this earth if you don't know this here. So it's critical for us. Maybe those are the people that Jesus is talking to at the end, depart from me. Yeah, you did this and you did that and you looked good. You had a form of godliness, but you denied the power. Yeah, aren't you glad you came today? I, uh, so the thing is this, is we're not advancing the kingdom. You know, the rest of the world looks at the church today and says, what is it that they have that I really need? Think about it. I mean, in the church at large, we, we lack signs and, and wonders. You know, the, most churches struggle for, for resources and, you know, there, there's church splits and, you know, people are going this way and that way because nobody can agree on anything. None. You know why? It's because everybody's idea counts and everybody's on the same level. But you know what Jesus said? He said, if you have division, you're in a house that can't stand. You're not gonna stand. So what, what is division? What does division mean? It doesn't mean, that, it doesn't mean that I've got a good vision, you've got a bad vision. It doesn't mean that I've got a great idea and yours is pathetic. It doesn't mean that I've got a good opinion and yours stinks. That's not what it means. And quite frankly, that is some of the misunderstanding that can exist in the church. We have almost demonized division. L l let me show you something. I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna, I think I may have showed this in years past, but it, it has to be uh, shown again just to give you an idea. Show that word division. You see, if you break that up into two pieces, die, D-I, di, that, that means more than one. It means, actually means two. So more than one. Vision is that exactly what it says. It's, it's vision. So division means more than one vision. Now Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. That means a house that has more than one vision will implode. It can't stand. Are you following me? See, everybody's vision may be good, but if there isn't one overarching dominant vision that drives us, then we can't stand. The house will not stand. It will not be stable. But let's move past church and let's go to your house. <clears throat> If your house has more than one vision, it cannot stand. It cannot stand. So you, you spouses, you better get on the same page. Because Jesus said, how can two walk together unless they agree? So if dad's got one vision for the house, but mom's got mm, another vision for the house, I give a short span of time on that marriage and the stability of that family. 
So when, when God sets up rank and, and alignment in the body of Christ, he's not, he's not setting up bullying or you know, some kind of a protocol that is going to constrain or, or confine us. No, he's setting up a rank and an and alignment to where there is a singular-minded vision in the house. For example, that's, that's why the Bible says that husbands are the head of the wives. Now, before we get off on a distorted plane here, just hang with me for a second and look at me. Don't look at your spouse, okay? It says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, if you haven't read that in a while, you ought to go back and read it again and then again. And then again and again, because there's some great things about Ephesians, about what we are to be in our position and what we are, what we are to be carrying out uh, individually. You ever want to know what God's will is for your life? Go, why don't you read Ephesians? That'll tell you a lot of what you're supposed to do. But it says in there, it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. It doesn't say women submit to men. That's not in there, okay? It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. So that means you don't have to submit to anybody else's, <laughs> okay? So why did he say, wives, submit to your own husbands? Because there should be a man in the house that is casting vision for the house, and you are a help meet. What that means is you help meet the vision. You see, so, so when we understand that that everything God is doing is, is about setting it, things up to advance the kingdom, then it should help us then to understand and be clear why we have to know and have an awareness of proper order and proper alignment. Now, let me show you an example of this in Scripture out of Numbers, the 12th chapter. And uh, this, this is going to show you the, what happens when alignment gets skewed and gets messed up. In uh, Numbers, the 12th chapter, um, I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Numbers. Uh, people call it the telephone book of the Bible. And uh, Moses married an Ethiopian woman. And God told him not to. And Moses clearly disobeyed, period. So you see this whole disobedience thing has been going back even with men that God used, obviously. Now, when that happened then what took place is Moses' assistants, Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron are Moses' older sister and older brother, okay? You've heard the names, you probably read about them, maybe you didn't know that. But what happened is they started copping a little bit of an attitude and pointing the finger and judging Moses because they knew he wasn't supposed to marry an Ethiopian woman, and he did. He, when he was away and he's on the mountain, they began talking about him. Now, maybe they felt like they had a right because they were family, and you talk about your family, right? You talk about your brothers and sisters, and when they're not doing stuff right, and he needs to get his act together, and whatever. And maybe it was a little bit of that, but the fact is this, they began talking. And we pick up in verse 2 of Numbers the, the 12th chapter. It says, so, so they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Ah, he, here, here it is. See, he's not doing it right. And you know what? I could do it better. I think God speaks to me. You know, we start getting these attitudes. Has he spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. You think he wouldn't? Verse three. Now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly, the Lord said, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, get here now. And he said, come out here, the three of you, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and he called Aaron and Miriam. Now remember, it was Moses who made the, the disobedient act. But this has to do with those who are being disobedient to authority. So here it is, he said, he, he brings them forward, they both went forward, then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. See what God is doing is he is establishing a rank He's establishing a, an order and alignment. And he said, I speak with him 
face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. In other words, I don't beat around the bush with Moses. I just say it like it is. And he sees the form of the Lord. No one else had seen that. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? <sighs> yeah, that's what they said too, I'm sure. <laughs> Let me interject a passage of scripture here before I go further. In Proverbs, the sixth chapter, let me show you something. Sixth chapter, 16 verse, it says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Abomination is a, is a disgust, a hate toward, okay? Remember, a disgust is almost like the lukewarm people talk about in the Laodicea in church in Revelation. I will spit you. It's disgusting, okay? This, this falls in line with that. And here, here's what the seven things are. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, well, you wonder why we talk against abortion all the time. Listen, it's right here. A heart that de de devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. He hates it. It is disgusting to God. Now, move back over to Numbers 12, and let's pick up at verse 9. So, the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, Miriam and Aaron, and he departed. I mean, he's so ticked off, he came and talked to him. He said, you know what? You guys are just driving me bananas. I just got to take a break for a second here. I got to catch, you know, God, God didn't have to take a break on anything. I'm just playing with that. But here he goes. And he said, and, he, and when the cloud departed, uh, then the cloud departed above the tabernacle. Suddenly, Miriam, Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned to Miriam or toward Miriam and saw that she was a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. People asking in this passage, why didn't Aaron turn leprous? Why was it Miriam? Because it was a woman's fault. No, but that wasn't it. It was not. But it, do you know what's interesting about this? And let me just give you a little bit of back history. Miriam was the older sister that back when Moses was born and he was a baby, and remember his mother put him in a basket, and he went down the river Nile along the banks until Pharaoh's daughter, he you know, floated into Pharaoh's daughter's court, and she picked him up. Miriam was the older sister that went in the bushes and made sure that it was all, it was all I mean, in other words, she probably was you know, partially um, you know, responsible for somewhat raising Moses because it actually turned out that when Pharaoh's daughter took Moses in, that, that Miriam was the one who came to the, to the princess and said, listen, ma'am, I will find the mother and we will help raise so she, she can breastfeed the, the baby and so on. And it was the princess, it was Pharaoh's daughter who said, go and do it. And it ended up being Moses' actual mom and Miriam, his older sister, that really raised Moses in those early years in the court. So maybe Miriam felt like she had Maybe she had a, a say-so in things. Like, this is my baby brother. You know, he did wrong. I need to point it out to him. I need to make sure. But things had shifted and changed because now Moses had been called and there was an anointing and there was an authority and there was a protocol and an alignment that God had set up. And you have to be aware of those things. Otherwise, it'll affect you. And so maybe it was, it doesn't say anywhere in scripture where Miriam said, oh, forgive me, Lord, I sinned. It was Aaron who did. And Aaron, the oldest of the, clan. He was a Levite, first one born into the family. Maybe he had a little bit more, you know, awareness to say, wow, we got this wrong. It doesn't say that Miriam did anything. So it was Aaron that came. He didn't get leprous, but he was the one that was saying, hey, Moses, we sinned. And so now in verse 12, he said, please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses, catch it, cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her. Oh God, I pray. And then the Lord said to Moses, okay, he said to Moses, if her father had spit on her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Okay, let her be shut out of the camp seven days. Afterwards, she may be received again. So listen, look at this whole thing. In verse two, 
When they came against and started saying the things that, Lord, hey, have you not spoken through us as well, not only through Moses? What, what you are seeing here is, is how another can cast or can attempt to cast another vision because of the visionary's impropriety. In other words, it's easy to point, oh, they did that wrong. I can do it better. And by the way, this is straight out of the B-I-B-L-E. So you can look at it anytime and you can read this. But then in verse 13, you see, you see a different picture when Moses comes back and he's crying out to God. Listen, God is wanting us to see two things here. First of all, he's wanting us to see God's attitude toward his leader that he has established. Secondly, he's wanting us to show you the leader's attitude towards those who are coming against him. The very people that are trying to split the church and mess him up. Moses is on his knees crying out to the Lord on their behalf. And so what happens is God carries out the punishment on Mary for a week and a week she's welcomed back into the fold. Now, let me go to a passage of scripture I read to you last week in Psalm 133. And let me tie this together just a little bit. In Psalm 133, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil. Dina was praying concerning the oil, like the balm of Gilead. That you know, It's the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, like the beard of Aaron. There's Aaron. He, Aaron's mentioned in there. Aaron, Aaron had a place in scripture running down the edge of his garments. It, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. So the anointing oil runs what way? It runs down. And dew descends, correct? I mean, dew doesn't start in the valley and then work its way up to the mountaintop. No, the, the oil flows down, the dew descends. And then it says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. And that blessing is life evermore. There, there he commanded. Everybody's looking for the blessing. We want to be under the spout where the glory comes out, don't we? We go to and fro in this conference, that thing. Look, just looking for the blessing. I can speak on blessing and it pumps people up, you know? I mean, you can draw crowds and sell books talking about the blessing because everybody wants to be where the blessing is. And it hasn't changed over time. It hasn't changed down through the generations. In First Chronicles, before David and his army of men were able to get the uh, Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, what happened is it stayed at the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom, probably one of your top three favorite baby uh, names. It stayed at his house for three months, okay? And it's interesting because the Bible says that, that Obed-Edom's house and everything that he had was blessed because of the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant there. That means his cattle started fattening up, man. The harvest of his field was great. The grapes were getting lush in the, in the vineyard, I would dare say. Probably he started growing his hair back. His wife was looking 10, 15 years younger. You know, the kids were starting to obey and, and like they never had before. I mean, I don't know if it went that far, but the fact is, is that when the presence of the Lord came, the Bible says that everything in Obed-Edom's house was blessed. But when David came back with his men to, dig, to take or to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, you know what happened? Is Obed-Edom looked at his wife and said, sweetheart, you need to go get some boxes because we got to pack up because wherever that thing goes, wherever the Ark goes, we're going with it. And I, I, it doesn't say that like I just said it in Scripture, but we know that Obed-Edom ended up back in Jerusalem because it's just a, a, a chapter or two later where it gives the declaration because David had set up worship and praise before the Ark of the Covenant and there were gatekeepers 24 hours a day and Obed-Edom and his sons and his grandsons were a part of that crew, the gatekeepers and the ones with the worship around the throne. So we know that he was there. Everybody wants to be where the blessing is. And Psalm 133 says, for the Lord commanded a blessing. See, when God commands something, it happens. It wasn't, it wasn't that, that God said that there's a place called there and when you get there, I'm just gonna let the blessing just kind of float down like snow from heaven. No, 
When you are there, you'll know you're there because I will command a blessing. Church, can, can you imagine living every day under a commanded blessing? In other words, a blessing is commanded to follow you wherever you go and in whatever you do. Think about that. When you lay down your head at night under a commanded blessing, you get up in the morning, you're under a commanded blessing. When you go and work out, when you should be working out, you're under a commanded blessing. When you go and punch the clock at work, you're under a commanded blessing. You date under a commanded blessing. You get married under a commanded blessing. Your kids go to school under a commanded blessing. Man, you pay your bills under a commanded blessing. You come to church under a commanded blessing. You bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord under a commanded blessing. I'm talking about a place called there. A commanded, where the commanded blessing of God is established and it's done. Who doesn't want to live there? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Psalm 133. Again, it says, behold. It says, how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now understand that this is where the oil starts flowing. In other words, what that verse just told us is that it is, it is unity. It is a coming together under an established vision that the oil begins to flow. So what we would have to surmise from that, that if there is not unity, the oil the, represents the anointing isn't flowing, at least like it should. It's there. The oil flows into a place called there. Let me, let me just break this down. It's, it's not how good and how pleasant it is just in this house when men dwell together. But let's get back to your house. Dean and I have shared a couple of thoughts in our times past when we talked about relationships. And I feel like this one thing needed to be injected into here. You have to understand that God didn't set up headship in the kingdom just in the corporate, the local church. God set up headship in the kingdom in the home. Do you understand that? See, I mean, why did God say, again, that the man is the priest of the home, the, the head of the house? Why? Is it because God had favorites? And he preferred one over the other? Absolutely not. No, he was, again, he was trying to set up an order, a, a, a flow. How does the oil flow? It flows down. So if you have more than one vision in the house, the house can't stand. You won't make it. So here's what he did. He established a flow, just like he did with the children of Israel. He said, Moses is the man. I don't care what you think you know about him or how well you know him. If you changed his diapers and you told him what to do when you were younger, the bottom line is now this is the way it's set. That's the way God chose to do it, and that's the way we come. So here's what he did. This is how he chose to do it. In, in the, it's all throughout the word, but we see it really emphasized in, in the New Testament. You have the visionary, the man. This is in a, in a home, parents with kids. You have the helpmeet, okay? And the helpmeet, again, is supposed to help meet the vision of the visionary. You understand? But visionary, you need to have a vision. How can anybody help meet you do nothing? Okay? There's nothing more frustrating than for a help meet to be married to someone that will not move. So men... I'm look at me right now. How can your wife help you reach a goal, a vision, if nothing exists? I, I thought the women would at least say amen. But <laughs> See, and, and, and I understand. It's a, in our culture, in our society today, really, we... What we, what we find happening amongst men is men get discouraged a lot easier today. 
We're seeing a lot more. I mean, you, you don't have to look far to see it in our culture and our society. And though one of the key reasons for that is that more men now that are coming into adulthood have been raised by mama and they get out into the world and they realize that the world doesn't treat them like mama did. And so what it does is it, it can produce passive men, which, which I'm telling you, again, you don't have to look far to see this. It, it's it's an, becoming an epidemic in our nation today is that men aren't stepping up. Men aren't being men. They're, they're taking a back seat. They're being intimidated. They have never been taught. Whatever the reason, they're from fatherless homes, the more, more of them than not. And, and it's, it's affecting a nation. But I'm not worried about them as, as much as I'm just talking to the men who are here in this room and those watching online right now. Are, are, are you men, are, are you ready to stand up and, and, and to hold a standard? Are, are you ready to, to make your voice heard, first of all, in your home and then out in the marketplace in your world? Man, we got, we got to pull the fight out of us. And it's time for men to stand up and say, Satan, you get your hands off of my family. You are not welcome in my home. I will not lose my marriage. My kids will not go down a path of confusion. My, my, my world and what you have established and what you have ordered will be done because it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Where are the men in the house? Come on. There. Yeah. We will serve the Lord. You gotta have a vision for your house, guys. And let me, let me just say something else about vision here. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, it says that where there is no vision, the people perish. perish. You know that. Now, now when, in our English language, when we, uh, when we say the word perish, uh, to us, that means your heart stops beating and like you are, you're done. Okay, you die. But this was written in the Old Testament, which the original language was Hebrew. So in the Hebrew translation, and you may have heard this before, but you, you, you got to have our minds renewed to this, is what, what perish means is to cast off restraint and run wild. In other words, you show me a person that anything goes, I'll show you a person that has no vision. Let me bring us a little closer. You show me a person that will sleep with anybody, that will run with anybody, that's frivolous with their money. A person who's always late, never showing responsibility. I'll show you a person that has no vision. Because you see, because if you have the ability to cast off all restraint and run wild, then you don't know where you're going. You know why? Because it's the vision that brings the restraint. That's what you just cast off. If you don't have vision, you have nothing restraining you. Do you, do you know, uh, I mean, vision establishes the direction. Okay, so when you begin taking steps in, in that direction, the direction of vision, which may require you changing some things in your life and getting rid of some stuff and, you know, changing out who you hang out with and, and, you know, beginning to restructure your priorities and begin to declare the word over your life. Do you know what's happening when you're doing that? Is you are building banks, you are building uh, parameters or barriers or boundaries that control your life. Do, do you know why... Do you know why there's so much life in a river? I mean, a lot of fishermen, if you ask them, they'll say they would rather fish in a river than any other location. Why? Because, because it has banks and it causes the water to move and to flow in a particular direction. In other words, there's movement. There is life that's happening. And in the same way, it, you know, a, a river has life. A swamp doesn't have any. Well, I mean, I'm not saying there's not varmints in a swamp. But a swamp doesn't have any banks. It just, it just there, and the water becomes stagnant. You know, and, and nobody wants to fish in a swamp. You may catch a gator or two if, you, if you're not watching out. But nobody wants to fish in a swamp 
Because a swamp doesn't have life. It's not moving. It's, it's stagnant. And most of the time, a swamp stinks. I mean, I grew up in Florida. I didn't live too far from the swamps and the Everglades down there. And on hot, humid, muggy days, man, you could smell it, it stunk, and you just kind of got used to it growing up in that area. But the thing is this, that people who will cast off restraint are the ones who are always trying to get you to cast off your restraint. That's why you, you got to be careful who you hang out with. See, I, I believe there are people sitting in this auditorium right now, people sitting and, and watching us through our online audience, that have prayed and prayed and prayed, and you've sought and sought, and you've sown, and you've sown for, for deliverance from a, a certain addiction or a bondage or deliverance from a particular situation, and you're confused today because it doesn't appear that anything has happened. I need to tell you something, and there are many people that probably need to hear and to receive this. It's not going to come with just a prayer and a touch. It's going to come when you get a vision because it's the vision that creates the boundaries and the standards for your life. And you will see that when you get passionate and when you have an unquenchable fire about the things that God has shown you and given you and provided for you, that what will happen is you'll all of a sudden realize that I can't do that if I want to get there. So what happens is that begins to lose its grip on you because you're falling out of love with it and you are falling in love with your future, which is in Christ and him crucified. See, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be in the body. You want deliverance? Man, remember, it's the truth that you know that makes you free. Truth in, garbage out. More truth in, more garbage out. I'm not saying this. I'm saying we can't lay hands on people. We can't see people delivered. I'm not saying that. But for us to remain free, you better know the truth. And you better have a vision for your life. And if you have a vision for your life coming out of this book, then everything will shift and everything will change in your life. It will. So the enemy comes and he influences and he tries to pull you this way and he pulls you that way. And here comes vision and says, uh-uh, that, you get back inside these banks and you just keep moving forward. You keep your mind set on things above, not on things of the earth. You know, you're looking forward to that finished work, to the destiny that he's provided for you. And here's the thing. God wants a house where people dwell together in unity, not in discord. And just like we read over in Proverbs 6 a moment ago, God wants the house to be in unity. Because if it's not in unity, the abomination unto God, now listen to this, is the one who comes into something beautiful and sows discord. That's what he hates. That's what disgusts him. So why? Because when you sow discord, it's a violation of the flow, the anointing. Psalm 133 says, How good and how pleasant it is for people to dwell in unity, to be aligned. That comes out of the word alliance. Alliance, like a country can have an alliance with another country. The United States right now, and I don't know, it seems to be a little shaky, but as of this point, we have an alliance with Israel. That means that we have a common vision we have a, a common goal, understanding that we are aligned on and we, we have aligned together. We are an alliance. We have established, you know, an, an order. And th the same is true here. When, when it's good and precious that men and women dwell together in an alliance, it's in that, that divine alignment that the oil begins to flow. And it flows from the head, down the face, down the beard, down the garment. I'm just, Psalms 133, all the way to the hem of the garment. But what happens if right about here, somebody cops a Miriam Aaron attitude? So you know what, I don't believe that. 
I think that pastor, I think he's being a little bit too constrict. I think he's being, uh, way, he's, he, it's all legalism. I don't think that's the way God works. And I don't like the way they're doing this. And I don't like what they're saying. I don't like these people. And I, I don't like the pastor. And you start getting your friends and, and, and your family involved and, you know, getting all mad at the pastor. But here's what I want you to understand is when that happens, if you do that, you, you are not violating the person. You have stopped the oil. You have. Psalm 133 says that it's good and pleasant when the oil flows all the way down to the hem of the garment. In other words, everything is being touched. Every part is being saturated. Everything is happening. And, and why does he hate the sower of discord? Why? Why did he say it's an abomination to him? Because it violates the oil, the anointing. That means that there's somebody after that break that is not receiving the oil. The anointing, you know why? Because it stopped at you. Your life means something in the kingdom. <laughs> this is not a game, folks. This is life. Your words carry weight. What you put in and how you think and what you project, it carries weight. Will you stand to your feet? I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can to, I mean, that's our heart, to take you through truth. Truth offends. It offends in the face of unrighteousness. The Bible is is offensive to unrighteous action or unrighteous thinking. But I tell you what, church, I am, I am sick and tired of the world looking at the church and not seeing anything that they want. I'm, I'm wanting a healthy respect and an honor to come back to the house of God and back to men and women of God. And some of that's been our fault. We've, some of us have acted screwy. Some of us hadn't acted anything. Some of us hadn't said anything. Because people are looking for something that, that denotes or gives them a hope of freedom in their life. And if they look at you every day you work by them and every day that you interact with them and they don't see anything different than what they're dealing with and how you, they deal with it is how you're dealing with it. What are we showing the world? Why would they even want Jesus? Now we're called and empowered to go. We're called and empowered to be like Dina prayed earlier, that, that healing balm of, of Gilead, wherever, wherever we go, that there is something about us and who is in us that attracts people to us. They're attracted to your conversation. They're attracted to, to your world and what you're about and what you do and what drives you. Man, all that is is just living Jesus. It's being a, a reflection of Christ in our world. Hey, if it's the truth that makes us free, the truth that we know that makes us free, it's not just the truth, because this, this here it holds the truth. But if this just sits on your cabinet home when you get home, or you never even picked it up in a month, that means nothing. It's the truth, it bears the truth, but it's when this gets ingested into our lives and into our heart, and it's the word implanted, James says, that's able to save our souls. The word implanted, now your spirit is saved when you ask Christ into your heart, but your soul is being saved. You need to go through activate too. Your soul is being saved. There are things that you've been used to doing for years that may not just be changed in your life until you get truth in you and you know truth so that you can effectively cast out any unrighteousness.
Do you understand? That's how you remain free. What we have is exactly what the world is looking for. They don't know it. They don't know that this is what it is, but we've got it. We carry it as a house of God. We carry that. But it's one thing to carry something. It's another thing to open up the lid and let it benefit our life and those around us. I would hope and pray that the majority of the people in here are carriers of the Holy Spirit. But my ultimate prayer is just not that. My ultimate prayer is that everybody that has the Holy Spirit is just letting it flow, man. You are so in love with God, just like we prayed earlier. Man, there is nothing that holds you back. You're not, you're not gonna be afraid to lift up the name of Jesus. Man, you're, you're speaking life into your world. You're not letting little picky things and what they did and what they said and what you don't like about this person. Oh, they, just get rid of all that judgmentalism because the fact is, is what, what measure you judge, it'll be measured back to you again. You don't have any right. As a matter of fact, I'd be a little scared if you're sitting in judgment over things all the time. So the point is, is let's let Jesus shine. Let's let the Holy Spirit go forth. Let's get divinely aligned and let's go and let's take it into our family and into our world and into our office and our school and our marketplace. And let's watch, let's watch the power of God. Man, stir within us and bleed out over everybody we come in contact with. Amen. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit. We hope you enjoyed this week's service. Please like and subscribe to this channel to stay involved with all of our content, but also download our app, Without Walls AZ, to stay informed of what's going on in the future. In the meantime, God bless.